I have thought back a little bit over the connections I've had over the years with Emmanuel. It actually goes back into the 50s when Dr. Vaught asked me to do a youth retreat. Now, I'm not qualified to do that now, you understand, don't you? A youth retreat back in the 50s at Camp Couchdale, I believe. Probably some of you may have been there. But then all the way for the times that I did a revival for him and then the times my wife was, uh, passed away and you prayed for me. Actually, both wives, you have uh, kind of shouldered the load and prayed for me during all of those times. So uh, I've been a member now for several years since I retired from being executive director of the Arkansas Baptist State Convention. And uh, I love being a member of this church. I'm proud of my church. I enjoy this church. And, I enjoy the preaching. Sometimes I have to go home and listen to it again. Maybe you're like I am. You just want to get a little bit more of that. But anyway, Pastor, thank you so much for being a good leader. A good leader is a person who has courage. And what the pastor had, has asked us to do takes courage. You say, well, now, all of us believe in prayer, so why should that be any daring thing to do? Well, because we believe in prayer chiefly from a functional standpoint. It's the way you tell people it's time to hush and start church. It's the time to say, we're through with church, go home. It's really just kind of a segue. I threw that in for the young folks that you would know. You'd be proud I knew that word. It's a segue. That's just something you do to kind of cover whatever, whatever else is going on. So we pray during the offering or we pray during the transition from people on the platform. Or we just do it to start service or something. And I'm telling you, based on the scripture that I read, uh, that, that Cody read for us a while ago, this business of prayer is serious business because it says we have confidence about this. We can enter the most holy place. Well, surely you remember the messages all through Exodus that the pastor led us on, all about the tabernacle and the holy place or the holy of holies. And he says now because of Jesus, you can enter that holy of holies all the time. Just think about being granted the highest privilege that could be granted to us on earth and then not taking advantage of it. And that's the situation with us so much of the time. We have this great privilege he's purchased for us and we fail to take advantage of it. So he says, it's the most holy place, but he said, let us draw near to God with sincere heart in full assurance. Now, I'm not going to try to expound this passage of scripture, though it's a great one to do that. But there are two words that really are keys to me for the message today. And what I believe God has asked me to do is to talk to you about drawing near. He said, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance. So, the assurance and the confidence. Assurance and confidence. Because we are in turbulent times, we need assurance and we need confidence. And he said, here it is, folks. It's all at the point of prayer. It's all at the privilege of being in the holy place and engaging him in prayer. This week, I think it was Thursday, the lady who is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, WMU, contacted me. Her name is Sandy. Sandy said, uh, Brother Don, I've, I've always known you and I know you've been into prayer and all. Tell me why you have hope in this period of time. She said, I'm about to speak to a significant group of people and I'm struggling to tell them why I have hope. I want to know why you have hope. Well, I just went right to this business of prayer. I have hope because God is a prayer answering God. And I want us to have hope. And so today, when you think about this privilege of prayer and entering into that holy place, I want us to think about several different things. But in getting into that, here's what I want you to think about a little bit. Everything that God did significant throughout history involved transition, right? So they're down in Egypt. He has to get them into the wilderness because he's going to transition them from Egypt to the wilderness and from the wilderness to Canaan. So it's transition, transition, and every move is to make things better. And then you come through that period of time when you have the judges, you have the kings, you have the prophets, you have the priests, all of those things. And there's about 400 years of silence. Guess what? They're having to transition. We're coming to a new period of time when Jesus is to come into the world. And guess what? After his glorious life and reign and, and the, the wonderful things he did, he's going to leave. Guess what? Transition again. 
And after he leaves, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and then one day Jesus is going to come, and we're going to be going to heaven, and we're going to be transitioning once again. The thing I want us to remember about any transition, that there's risk in it, there's uneasiness in it, and as a result of that, though, God always ends up with something new. God loves new things. He moved from the old covenant to a new covenant. He, he, he ushered in a new age with the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to make you a new creature. I'm going to make you a new world, a new heaven, a new earth. And guess what? God's still in the business of making things new. And every transition is supposed to result in something new. So here we are in this uncertain time when leaders far and wide are wondering what in the world to do. And God gave our preacher courage enough and sense enough to say, we must seek God and find out from him what he, he wants done. So here's what I want to do is just talk a little bit now about how God has positioned us at this time. In other words, what's going on? I'm not going to try to interpret world events, but what's going on with the, with the church and the world? I want to say, first of all, internally, I feel like God has done something really great at Emmanuel. Now, <clears throat> hang with me on this. I believe that organizationally, programmatically, financially, and personally, we at our stage of greater flexibility than we may have been in a hundred years. Yeah. We can adjust. We can adapt. We can change. Culturally, racially, socially, we are more diverse and we're more open than we have ever been. Oh, so if God wanted to really do something drastic, he thinks we probably could handle that. Facility-wise, he has given us everything we need for whatever ministry he may want us to, to have in the years to come. So internally, he has us ready. Externally, what we have is a world where people are faced with dead-end streets more than ever before. Government, science, education, materialism, philo philosophical uh, approaches leave a vacuum in people's life. It's almost like, you know what, how it is when you drive through one of these little old country towns and all the stores are boarded up. There's nothing but dirt and dust and uh, uh, spider webs all over the place. And there's just something haunting about that. I think that's a pretty good analogy for what's happening in people's lives. They're going to be like somebody's moved out. A man said not long ago, I heard him say it, he's president of the World International House of Prayer. He said, if you want to invest in something that's going to go in increase in value, you better invest in prayer. Buy stock in prayer. Because he said the cry for prayer is going to be so, so tremendous in the years to come because of what society is leaving in the hearts and lives of people. Prayer. Okay, so externally, the world needs us bad. Internally, God has us ready. Practically, there is no hope but God. I fear no contradiction of that. There is no hope but God, and there's no hope with God unless we follow his prescription. And what's God's prescription? God's prescription is prayer. That's the reason Jesus said men ought always to pray and not faint. Because we are in that situation where today it would be real easy to faint, get discouraged, give up, say there's no hope. We can't do that because we can pray. So that's the practical significance of it. And for the pastor to have sensed this and led us in that, that is so great. Okay, I want now to talk about whether we are following a good model. He's asked us to spend these all this time in prayer in the Sunday school classes and and all, and you know, when, when I first thought about that, I thought, well, now, I love hearing our people in our class pray, but usually a person only prays about a few minutes and it's all over. And I like what Cody said a little in, early in the service, that after you've gone so far and you're ready to quit, well, hold up your hand because we're supposed to be praying some more. Most of us do not know how to pray. I've been reading a book called Invitation to Solitude and Silence, and she said, if you're going to try to pr practice solitude and silence, don't set more than five minutes as your goal because we get so uncomfortable because we don't know what to do with it. 
when we have access to the King of glory. We have access to the Creator. So we just need to understand that this privilege that God is giving us is so great. But now the, the model is what I'm asking about. Is this a proper model? The preacher calling us to pray like this. Well, when I read about Jesus and all that took place in his life and he said, everything I've done, I've done under the, uh, under the Father's direction, everything I've said, I got it from the Father. My whole life is about the Father and how did he know about the Father and what to do? And Scripture's clear, it was prayer. Then you come to the New Testament church. The whole church scenario was saturated in prayer. And when they had that wonderful experience at Pentecost and not soon after that they started having conflict in the church the preacher said hey this is not what church is about settling squabbles this church is about prayer and the ministry of the word so in Acts chapter 6 and verse 4 they said hey guys you're gonna to have to take care of all this other stuff we must give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word verse 7 says revival broke out Ooh, you reckon we could handle that Revival is risky, friends, because there's nothing God will lead us to do and experience in revival that will not, not make somebody uncomfortable. Do you want to just coast along and drift along, or are you willing to run the risk of being uncomfortable? I mean, we're asking God to do something, show up, and, and do things that will be unquestionably the work and hand of God. Now, not only do we have the pattern of Jesus and the New Testament church and the, the apostles, but there's an Old Testament pattern. In, in Psalm 107, there are four different instances, and I'm, I'm going to read these to you rather than look, turn to it. In Psalm 107, verse 5 and 6 says, They cried out to the Lord. Their lives ebbed away. Listen to the conditions. Their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he del delivered them from their distress. Two words to remember, crying out and distress. In verse 12 and 13, it says, They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried out to the Lord, and he saved them from their distress. Psalm 107, 18 and 19, They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. Verse 26, in their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. That's where we are as church and as a society in terms of all that's going on. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord, and he delivered them from their distress. Are you good at crying out? You say, I don't like to cry. It makes my sinuses act up. Well, I'm the same way. I don't like to be emotional. Well, I'm sorry. You can't be in the presence of holy God and not be emotional. You may fall on your face like Isaiah did, but there is, any, there is no way we can experience the presence of God without it having a tremendous impact emotionally. So here these people are. Every time they turn around, there is a crisis, there is a need. You say, well, Don, is there, are there that many crises in the church? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about crisis in the world in which he has placed us. We didn't choose this time. We didn't choose this place. He did. And he figured that he could count on us being there and crying out to him. And he said, I will deliver you from your distress. So I really think that we need to understand that this pattern this precedent that he's calling for, this practice of praying like this, I just think this is so of God. I really do. Now, let me just talk a little bit about what God, what really pleases God. And I found this also in that Hebrews opening. If you're still open there, we opened it earlier to uh, Hebrews 10. In Hebrews 11, listen to this first two verses. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Listen to this. This is what the ancients were commended for. You know what that means? God really was proud of the older people when they believed him, when they trusted him. They had faith in him. He commended them. Now, you go all the way down to the end of that chapter. Do you remember that's the faith chapter? It has all that long list of fabulous things people did. And look at verse 39. These were all commended for their faith. Okay. One of these days, 
God's going to wrap this thing up, and we're going to be brought into His presence. Will we as a church be commended for our faith? Okay. I don't think he's talking about a vocabulary change. Start using the word faith. He's talking about a works change because they were not commended because they knew the word faith. They were commended because of the actions their faith called for. Now, that's what he says, that's what makes me proud. It's when my people, when I, when I nudge them, when I move them, when I prompt them, they just obey. They know that I wouldn't lead them wrong, so they obey. One of the things I'm going to ask you to do toward the end of the service is ask you to be willing to trust God when you do not understand. Well, there's almost nothing about God we really understand, so we have to trust God all the time. But when it comes to organizations like this and we start moving in some new directions, we may not understand. We may not, un we may not agree. Well, since when does God have to wait till you agree with him before he does anything? He isn't going to wait on you. He's going to go off and leave you, and you're going to be like a little bit of trash floating down a creek that will end up in a little eddy out to the side, lost and dead and undone. God wants us to believe him, and so I'm going to ask you to commit yourself to trust him and follow him whether you understand or whether you agree or not. God loves his people to trust him. <clears throat> God didn't seem to do anything in this chapter that was normal. You get over in that Hebrews 11 again. He tells, I don't know what happened with Abraham, but God must have said, son, we've got these old test testosterones going again. Maybe you and Sarah ought to get together tonight. Well, that took a little faith. The Bible described his body as being almost like dead. Well, I don't have to interpret that anymore literally, do I? But he had faith, he obeyed God, and they had that baby. What would you think if God took you out to the, to the Arkansas River and he said, you know, we need to make a path to get across this river. Why don't you take that uh, crutch of yours or that cane and hold it out over it, and we'll take care of this. That wasn't very normal. That never happened before. What about if you were Noah and he said, I know it's never rained, son, but there's going to be some rain coming. You better build a boat. God did all those things that were not normal. They were not usual. They were not common. That's how God works. Now, I want you to hang with me right here for just a minute because when we are seeking the Lord, the pastor, the staff, and all of us, when we're seeking the Lord, we're wanting to know His will, but somehow or other His will fits in the cocoon of His way. And what I'm talking to you today about is God's way. And God's way is to put a challenge out there before us and prompt us to move and expect us to do it. And then he does the, the supernatural. So what this does, all this time of praying and everything, seeking the Lord, it really puts us in a crisis of faith. Those of you that studied uh, Blackaby's book on experiencing God, you remember that was a big part of the book, experiencing God, the crisis of faith. So what is our crisis of faith? Okay, listen. Listen carefully. Do we want our best? And that's pretty good. Or do we want his best? The difference is made because of prayer. Do we want historic words? Because we do have a good heritage. Or do we want heroic works? I love the, I love the historic words. But I'll tell you what I love. I love are the heroic works. You say, well, have you ever seen that? Oh, yes, I have seen that. I went to pastor a church one time that for the previous two or three years, they had been declining. I went there. I did all the tricks I knew to do as a preacher, and we just kept on going down. So one night when all the Sunday school workers together, I was talking to them there, and I said to them, folks, I don't believe God brought me here to bury this church but we're dying. And by that time, my voice began to quiver and break, and my heart broke, and I said, I don't know what else to do but to ask you to cry out to God. Well, I had my hands over my face, but I could hear the shifting of chairs, those old metal chairs on that concrete floor, and so I peeped. I peeped, and lo and behold, y'all, 
All those Sunday school workers were pushing their chairs back, getting down on the floor on their knees and crying out to God. I didn't ask them to do that. There was just something. And we can talk to you about prayer till we're blue in the face. But there must be something happen in our hearts that says this is the only way. God is the only way. So they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And I'm going to tell you, that was the night God changed the direction. The first two years of my ministry there was just a veritable hell. It was horrible. But after the night when the church was broken and prayed, ten years were wonderful. The last year I was there, I baptized 301 people. That's the reason I never wanted to leave the church to be executive director of the Baptist Convention, because God was doing so much. I had people in the church would come and say, Preacher, you know, things were kind of dry last weekend. We better get these men back in the altar praying. I'll never forget, one was a carpet layer. He just a common laborer, but he was so sensitive in his spirit. And he, he said, we better get these men back in this altar. Man, we'd get the men back in the altar praying, and next thing you know, here people would come. Here's a big old boy named Jim Davis sits off over here. He wouldn't come forward at all in the invitation, but after the service was over, he's sitting over there bawling. And I go over there, and I say, Jim, what's the problem? He said, I'm a Vietnam veteran. He said, I'm scared to death. He said, I never know when I'll have a flashback, and I'll dive under a seat and scream and cry out or something like this. But he said, I need Jesus. And Jim gave his heart to Jesus right there. Back over on this other side on another Sunday, there was a young man came several times with his wife and children. And uh, so after church, he was sitting back there still just with his head in his hands. And I went back there and I said, what's the situation? He said, and he told me what it was. He was a sloppy drunk from New York. And he had married a woman in the South and moved down here and started having these kids. And he, he was a Jewish guy. And he said, I need Jesus, I need Jesus. And so he gets saved. What I'm telling you is, when God's people begin to cry out to him, God begins to doing extraordinary things. So historic words are nice, but heroic works are better. In that same church one Sunday morning, a man called, and his daughter and her husband were down in Jackson, Mississippi, looking for a new home. He was going to be the administrator of a hospital. They needed to find a new home. And it was a slick time, it was raining, and his car skidded sideways in the path of an 18-wheeler. It cr crushed into the side of the car where his wife sat and practically tore her right leg off. The daddy was calling me and he said, Now, Don, I know you've got church today, but you're going to have those people together and you need to pray for Sandra. I said, Oh, yeah, I will pray for Sandra. He said, I followed them the gurney down the hall. And said, it looked like you had a ketchup bottle just pouring out ketchup all the way down the hall in the hospital. He said they gave her 56 units of blood. A cardiologist in the church came to me after the service. He said, I've never known anybody to live taking that many units of new blood in that short a period of time. Well, the time came for me to preach. 11.30, Sunday morning. And uh, I got up to preach, and I couldn't preach. All I could do was pray and ask those people to pray. And so about 3.30 in the afternoon, I got the call again. And he said, Brother Don, I just need to tell you that the, the blood stopped. They stopped the bleeding. I said, can you tell me about when it was? He said about 11.30. Guess what was happening? We built a build, big old building. I was proud of that building. We did all kinds of stuff like that. But I would rather my church be known as a praying church than anything else. Anything else. And what I'm telling you is, historic stories about the church are nice, but heroic deeds, heroic works are much greater. Another crisis of faith is we have to decide whether we're going to abide with lovely traditions or whether we're going to thrive on the living Lord. I'm telling you, you can almost idolize your traditions, but you will never transform a life or transform a city. It's by the living Lord, not by lovely traditions. He's never called us. He's never called us to follow our traditions. He's called us to follow him into the highways and hedges. We can make a choice between orthodox teaching and be proud of that and transforming truth, which is what God would have. 
precious memories or a preeminent presence. That's what the choice is. Precious memories are a preeminent presence, the presence of God. There is a tragic tendency on the part of mankind to think that sameness, sameness represents safety and security. That may be true in some areas physically. In other words, if you're trying to go through a minefield and you know that there's a path that's safe, it's safe and best to stay on that path. But we're not walking through a minefield that's latent. We're in a minefield that's exploded. Sameness does not represent safeness, nor does it represent security. And so the situation is, spiritually, sameness represents suicide. And none of us want that spiritually or any other way. Okay, so that brings me down to the last thing I want us to talk about. What can we expect? Well, we can expect to be uncomfortable. I can't tell you what God's going to lead them to say that they believe God wants us to do, but we will learn that together. You know, if we had an opportunity this afternoon to go out on Lake Hamilton, go out on Lake Hamilton, and we find out with our group on our little party barge that somebody has drowned out in the middle of the lake, and there are several vessels out there trying to, to uh, find that body. And we say, you know, we don't really need to be involved in all that. We'd just be a distraction. We'd be in the way. So I, as, as we were coming up this bank over here, I noticed a little cove. It was real quiet and still. We could probably just dock over there and let the kids get out and swim, and we could relax and hear. While out there, they're trying to save somebody. It would be so easy for us to anchor this ship in a safe place and think, oh, I feel good. I feel good. You're not called to feel good. You're called to feel bad. Feel bad about that city or about that person or that family that needs to be reached. So what can we expect? We can expect that we're going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be risk, there's going to be resistance, and there's going to be resolve. And, and it, when, we, when we resolve to o obey Him, even though we may not understand and we may not agree, there will be glorious results. Okay, I mentioned earlier that we have demonstrated that we can flex, adapt, and advance with regard to physical location. The main issue, I mean, we made the move from downtown We've made the move with all these buildings. We've made adjustments to new staff. We've made adjustments to some change in worship style. We've made adjustments to just about everything. Now, the, the point is, when you're doing buildings, they're square feet and they're around dollars and all those kinds of things. Even lost people understand. The question is, can Emmanuel Baptist Church adjust to the spiritual challenge of the day. And we cannot apart from the intervention of God. That's the main issue I think we have. So Jesus gave us three great powerful metaphors to talk about how we're supposed to impact the world. He talked about light, he talked about leaven, and he talked about salt. He said, you know, if salt is not doing its job, you might as well throw it out in the street. Whoa! What if Emmanuel's not doing its job? He said, light has to be of such intensity that it will pierce the darkness. What if our light is not piercing the darkness? What about the leaven? He said, leaven, yeast, just fills the whole lump. And so he said, I've placed Emmanuel in Tulaska County, Arkansas, in Little Rock, Arkansas, to leaven the whole lump. What? if they don't do that. So what I think I need to ask you to do, maybe you still have something you could write on there. I would really like to ask you to make a commitment to pray that God would make us a house of prayer. The most upset we ever see Jesus, he wasn't upset over his crucifiers. He was upset over church people that were doing everything but praying at church. He said, God intended for this place to be a house of prayer, and you're doing everything but pray. Would you make a commitment in your heart on every occasion and every venue or situation, help make this church a house of prayer? 
In other words, if there are people on the other side of town or the other side of the county that have a child with a leg torn off, would they call here and say, you can count on these folks? They meet God. That's what I want us to be known for. Second thing I want you to do is make a commitment in your heart to pray for the pastor and for the staff. Because when Moses was the mighty leader that he was, he could not do it alone. The Amalekites, or Amalekites as some people pronounce it, they were out there fighting Israel, and Israel was losing. And to be honest with you, from every data standpoint, the church in America is losing. What can make the difference? Aaron and her were holding up his arms so that as long as his arms were held up representing intercession and prayer, they were winning. So it was prayer that made the difference, and the leader had to have the support for that to happen. So I want you to make a commitment that this will become a house of prayer. Second, I want you to make a commitment to hold up the hands of the preacher. And third, I want you to make a commitment that you will obey God, that you will follow by faith whatever he says, whether you understand or agree or not. Now, that's a big one for you. Because the issue is not whether you trust him. 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 The issue is whether you trust him. And if you're praying, I'm praying, everybody else is praying, it's trusting him. So whatever you ask us to do, we're going to need to be ready to do. The last thing I want you to make a commitment to, and I think we'll just let you do it right, right there at your seat. The last thing I want you to make a commitment to is to radically move in your own personal prayer life. Let me ask you this. Are you as good a prayer as you're going to ever be? Good Lord. What if the only hope for these children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren is the effectiveness of my prayer. Mercy, Lord. God, you've had me saved for all these years. You've had given me all kinds of experience. Lord, I can't believe I'm not a more powerful intercessor than I am. <clears throat> God, transform my prayer life. Let me learn how to cry out to you so that you can deliver us from, your tra from distress. Okay, so first of all, pray that God will make this a house of prayer, okay? Second, you're going to pray for the pastor and other leaders that we can give the support we, uh, in prayer that we need to. Third, you're going to pray that God will help you to be supportive and helpful, even though you may not agree or understand. And last, you're going to say, God, transform my prayer life. Before I leave this world, Lord, I sure would like to be a great prayer. I don't think you could have a better goal and ambition than that. So that's where we are. Let's bow our heads, and I want you to be thinking about those things, and we're just going to close now with the prayer, but then we have recognition that we need to do also. Lord, your people are thinking... <clears throat> They're evaluating their own prayer life. They have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren that desperately need them to be mighty prayer warriors. So, God, would you call out some people today? Lift them up to the next level of prayer and intercession. And like Jesus, who has spent 2,000 years interceding for us, may we spend our, t our days and our years interceding for others like he has. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a leader in Dr. Smith, a man of courage, convict us to support him daily, hourly, whatever, in prayer. And bless, dear God, our church, that we will come to not just be known as that big old building on the hill, but they'll come, be, come to know us as that church that has a lot of people who believe God, and there's power happening on that hill. God, let your transforming presence touch our hearts, change us, eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and God bless.